and welcome to this interview with John Gumry, one of our artists presently on display at Alpha Art Gallery's current exhibition of Beyond the Brush. My name is Rebecca Stevie, and together we'll be going over some of John Gumry's artistic processes as well as the pieces that were very graciously contributed to both our physical and online presentations. I kind of want to start out by talking about your history as a painter. What draws you to painting as a medium? Well, um, I guess it basically I've, I've always been making art ever since I was a kid. Um, I used to do sculpture oh, also, um, and I've done some printmaking, but I guess the, the thing with painting is that it's something that I can always do. You know, there, there are, um, limitations and requirements for sculpture that, um, I don't have to worry about with painting. I just um i have my studio set up here and i can always stretch canvases um and just or or i also work on panels um but yeah i could i can just run with it like that so um yeah i've, I've just i've just always painted and uh it's it's something that is uh i i can i can I can keep doing, you know, I don't, have the, I don't have the restrictions that I have with other things, maybe. Yeah, it's kind of the possibility of you're able to do practically anything on a canvas and put. Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it, in my case, it pretty much always comes down to something representational, although, of course, I take liberties with things, but uh, yeah. What draws you about? that kind of representational work. We'll get into it with other questions, but I'm curious, because you're saying that you're, the beauty of painting is that you can put anything down. What draws you about making representational work in particular? Um, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's my comfort zone. Um, the, the way I see things, you know, I'll just be um, if I'm going someplace or just looking around, I'll see things and I, I think now there, you know, that, that could be a painting. Um, mm -hmm. so I guess I have a tendency to see the world around me as, um, uh, material for a painting. Neat. Do you mind telling me about your artistic influences and what, how you bring those into your paintings? Yeah. Um, I guess now oftentimes when, when people look at my paintings, the, the first name that comes to their mind is Hopper mm -hmm. and uh he is certainly a favorite of mine he's I guess, I guess he's always been ever since i was a teenager um it's i think when i went back to art school at the pennsylvania academy it opened up my horizon to a lot of other people too i'd have to say that well parenthetically maybe my my mother was a painter uh she was a portrait painter um so of course, also representational. It was always, uh, in terms of influence, it, it, painting was always there for me. And so, yeah, I'd have to count her as an influence. Um, some of the other painters I appreciate or, or I draw things from, uh, Vermeer is a favorite for me. I've always been interested in looking at the way he he looked into space and you can see layers of space in his compositions, you know, in, uh, well, mostly in interiors, like there's, I forget the title, but where he's looking through a doorway that has some curtains around it, that kind of thing. And then at the other end, um, probably going about as far as you can go, uh, Rothko, mm -hmm. who, it would not be an obvious choice for me, but um, I like his sort of rough rectangles of color. They like makes it look like light is coming through um, another layer. Um, I'm not sure if that's what he in intended or not, but it. Uh, I, I think it, it. It's funny. I. I, I think despite being a representational painter, I have a tendency to work that into some things, you know, like if, I, if I'm doing a window or something, 
Um, sometimes I think of it as a little little mini Rothko, um, and um, kind of in the well, I talked about Hopper. Another person in the same similar vein is uh, Richard Diebenkorn. Um, uh, some other other people, I, I guess, are interest me, but I'm not. I don't necessarily um, know that they come through or, or, or obvious influences on me. Um, like um, lands, landscape painters of the uh, late 1800s, or uh, maybe the uh, the Hudson River River School from the from the 19th century. I love their work. Um, uh, Cecilia Bow is another one. Um, George Bellows, a, a guy, a local guy here in the Trenton area, um, who's pretty well known as Mel Leipzig. I studied with him in part time courses at Mercer County Community College, and I'm still in touch with him. Um, he's uh, in, interestingly, he's kind of a lot of his work looks almost like a photorealist painter, although his perspective is not really, uh, it's, it's more imaginative, I guess. It's not, not really strictly realistic perspective. And a, a guy whose work I discovered fairly recently, who was also local, I don't, I don't know him personally, but uh, Joe Gersack uh, does really wonderful paintings, uh, representational paintings with like a really nice, fresh, um, rough brushwork tr uh, treatment of the treatment of the paint, because it, 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 I think it, it gets you to look at the paint as a thing in itself, not just a material to recreate a, a scene. So that's what I like about his work. On that kind of topic of, of looking at local artists and the people around you, can you talk about the way, like where you're from and how that's affected your work? Because you talked about yeah, all people um, your, your area. I think that, that works its way into uh, my paintings pretty much. I grew up in Trenton. Hmm. Um, I went to school in New York and then I lived for, uh, actually at this point, I guess most of my life in Philadelphia. I, I moved back to the Trenton area. I'm across the river in Marsville, Pennsylvania now. Um, and uh, I've come, I, we're, I'm just right, right along the Delaware River, you know, two blocks from the Calhoun Street Bridge. Um, I love being by the river and been painting a lot of river scenes and water scenes. Um, I've also, I, I, I guess I've spent a good, good amount of time on the, on the water. Um, so that's 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 something that's a continuing thing for me, and, and actually, kind of something that um, I've been doing more of um, since I've been living here. Uh, a lot of landscapes with water scenes, um, and city cityscapes. As yeah, being around Trenton, Philadelphia, New York, and everything. Um, I guess cityscapes are just kind of all around me. Um, between that and interior scenes, which are kind of in the same vein, um, not quite the same, but yeah, uh, the built the built environment. Is that familiarity what makes you want to paint riverscapes and landscapes? That it's putting the things that you see and then putting it onto canvas. I, I'm sorry. Say, can you say that again? You're good. I said, is it the familiarity of having all these riverscapes and cityscapes all around you that compels you to put it into canvas? That it's it's. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, I guess just that it's uh, all around me, and that's kind of my little corner of the world that I that I paint. Is there something in particular that you find particularly compelling about? Cityscapes? Is there like a, a way that you would want to describe them? Well, um, you know, I think when when I was younger, um, I was 
I, I think you, you noticed in some of my uh, notes from before that I'm interested in the shapes, looking at things as, as sort of simplified geometric shapes. So there's that as a, as a piece of design and the way things come together there. I think though in recent years, I've been more aware of sort of personal content in my paintings. And part of that is uh, what, what something that connects with is that I, I've, I've done more things that um, combine human subjects or animal subjects in with uh, um, either city scenes or interior scenes, but basically, you know, people in the, uh, the, the environment, the built environment. Speaking of the way that you talked about putting shapes into your paintings, can you also talk about the ways that you use light in your paintings? The way that light is sculpted? Yeah, um, I guess I'm always interested in the patterns that lights and shadows create. Can I, I you know, there's a, there's a painting that uh, you have, we have on your list there. It's not actually hanging there at the gallery. October in South, October, South Philadelphia. And actually that was one that I, when I started painting again, back in 2005, I moved to South Philadelphia. I just looked at the views around my house and that was a, that was a view from my bedroom. I think I, I got interested in the way the, the lights and shadows fell. As I mentioned in uh, other, other connections, I got interested in the, the patterns of the way the lights and shadows fell and how the angles and things created a, a repeated sort of a rhythm or a, as I, I've said, you know, where the shapes rhyme. Uh, so that's, that's been a bit of a constant, at least in the cityscapes, maybe not so much in landscapes, but yeah. This is pulling also from what you've mentioned in your artist statement. And I think I'm, I'm pretty fair using a bit here. So when you're talking about the rhyming, I still think that's true of your landscapes as well, because there's that mimicking of color. Is that something that you're doing as well in those pieces? And you know, maybe maybe not as consciously, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, where I see that, I'll pick up on it and run with it. Um, it's not always as, uh, as obvious, you know, maybe it's a little more disguised in, in landscapes because you're not talking about, you're not dealing with strict geometric shapes so much. But yeah, there are, I guess there are other kind of composition things that that go into landscapes. And, and just off, off to the side here, I, you know, when I started doing landscapes, I, I went, went back to school after many years. I went back to school at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and uh, loved studying landscapes there. But what occurred to me was the composition in a landscape is really challenging, um, more so than, you know, if, if you're working with a, a figure or you're working with a portrait, um, I don't want to say there, you know, there are only so many things you can do, but you have a general idea of the parameters like you know you know how you're gonna set up your figure or your your portrait model whatever and how how that fits in the space with landscapes it's just wide open it could be anything and um for a while i i thought my smaller landscapes got to be pretty good but i when i did larger ones um sometimes they just fell flat um, I, I find that less of a problem today. I, I feel pretty good about um, the landscapes I've done in recent years, um, but it, it just took, took some time to get to feel confident with it, you know, what I was doing with the composition. But of course, in landscapes, I always say, you know, like you've got um, the challenges, you've got there's so much green out there, and uh, it kind of gets sickening when you use too much. So uh, the trick is to break it up and use use different shades of green. I think about it a lot with um, different shades bringing bringing the foreground forward. Um, 
been, been looking at that a lot and some, some things I've done recently. No, definitely. I can totally see that both in what you mentioned earlier about your uh, local artist friends that you were talking about, Joe Grossach, of, of getting the landscapes and having both the realistic perspective and then playing with it a little bit. And then yeah. on top of the uh, fact that right. with your, your paintings, even yeah. it, you mimic the stuff that you do with your in, interior space paintings with your external landscapes by being like, well, all this grass is green, but inside you're able to have like the warmth red of the floors and reflected in the walls. And so finding yeah. those additionally in outside space and to be like, well, there's sure. probably blue here in this grass as well. And yeah, like yeah. You know, another thing I might mention, um, and I think you probably, you probably saw this in my information. I, uh, you know, my mother, the artist, encouraged me to major in architecture in college uh, thinking that that was a sort of a practical thing to pursue as, as an artist. Well, to be honest, I guess I, I kind of got sick of it. Uh, <laughs> did, did all the courses and everything, but it, my heart wasn't in it. But I learned a lot as an architecture major, um, not only in terms of, um, you know, rendering perspective and, and so on, but a lot just in terms of, um, you know, sort of artistic principles or whatever. Um, I think one thing I've made note of in my statement, though, is that I, I do a lot of things with architectural subjects, but I'm, unless I'm being paid to do a rendering or something, I'm not really interested in the building as a thing in itself so much, or, or you know, as a, as a subject for a... Um, you know, like a strict architect type of representation. I, I, I've always thought bore, boring buildings can be a great subject for a painting. Um, just everyday plain buildings. It depends on what you do with them, how you handle the light and the shapes and so on. And you, you can you can always, I, th I think I, one of my teachers at the academy, I think he said, you know, you're, you're allowed to lie when you're an artist. You're, you're just not allowed to be boring. Uh, so I try, I try not to be boring, but it doesn't bother me, bother, bother me too much to, uh, to tell, tell a lie with my paintings. I, I frequently just, uh, I rework things and fudge the, fudge the details to make it a more interesting composition. And generally related, but in your artist statement, you also say that you, you pulled a quote from Minton Avery that says, why talk when you can paint? Yeah. So is that kind of in the same vein? Of yeah, I think so. Well, uh, I mean, well, maybe you can't tell right now, but I'm actually not much of a talker. Uh, but I, uh, I mean, I'm a kind of, um, yeah, you know, naturally kind of shy, and I, I don't, uh, at least I, for most of my life, I haven't been a big, um, you know, com communicator with. Uh, with words and in, in, um, in conversation. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather just paint. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's, it's just how I, I guess it, you know, not to uh, sound all hoity-toity or something, but it, it's, uh, I guess it's just how I relate to the world through painting. Of all the works either submitted to the show or if you have any on hand, could you talk about which ones are your favorites or one that you have a particular attachment to? Um, yeah, now you, you mentioned Scrabble with Cats. I, I like that one a lot. And actually I have another one that, that, that it's not actually hanging, but it's on your website. And I have it here on a book oh, cover. Yes. Um, the bookshop, bookshop over in Trenton. My, my wife and I, um, when we moved to this area, we started playing Scrabble on Friday. I tell people this is what this is what nerds do on Friday nights in Trenton. We play Scrabble at the bookshop. But um, I, I guess I what I like on this one, you know, it's it's the it's a building scene. It's a city scene. But I I think when I when I did this, I was really making a a point of. Um, working, you know, not just with 
buildings, but um, getting some human interest in there, working with, with human subjects, figures. Um, and so it's all part of the composition. Um, the, uh, as I was, uh, yeah, so my other Scrabble thing, they're Scrabble with cats. Uh, with that one, you know, there's, there are the angles of the cabinet in the foreground and then the angle of the door th that you see through the internal in inside window in the far background. Those angles kind of echo each other, I think. The other thing that interests me about, in that painting or uh, that I, I got a kick out of as I was putting it together, so that, that was my wife uh, posing there. She, uh, she and I both know that when I paint her, it doesn't usually uh, come across as a real portrait. I'm not really trying for a likeness so much. But one of the things I liked there was my wife as a character there, the cats are characters. They're all looking in different, different directions. She's looking at the cat, the cat's looking at us. And then there's the other cat in the background that's looking at her. Um, but then there are, in the cabinet, there are other what I'll call characters. There are the, uh, the portraits on the bowl. You can kind of imagine they're looking out at us and there's a doll on the shelf. Also the Frangelico bottle, which I think, I think when they designed that, it was modeled on a, on a monk, you know, so it's kind of reminiscent of a, of a, of a human figure there. Uh, so I kind of enjoyed working with those elements, the, 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 human and animal elements there. Another one uh, I think you mentioned in your notes, uh, uh, this happens to be another one of that my wife figures prominently in. Um, after midnight, I just started sketching her while she was sitting on the couch there. And then as I started working with the painting, I put in things like, like the rug on the floor. I, I love Persian rugs. Mm -hmm. uh as a as a representational painter that's kind of my little little piece of indulging in um abstract design i just like the jazzy shapes so it, one thing where i'm talking about um repeating shapes that I, I i say that they rhyme or they half rhyme you'll notice there are a lot of angles or, or pointers that kind of like arrows that point in different directions the way her her legs are arranged that's they point in a direction, there the way the piano bench is angled that points at her. Then there, there are a couple of V shapes on the rug that point toward her. The uh, magazine cover on the floor kind of echoes that kind of shape. And then there's the um, the bronze statue of the elk on top of the clock, which I've used in a couple different paintings. Uh, the elk and the clock kind of go together and there's the figuring out what time I would put on the clock. The um, important thing there was not so much what time is it, but what shape do the, the hands make, you know, so they make another arrow pointing in. So you kind of, it kind of goes around in a, in a, I'm not going to say in a circle, but kind of. All oh, the, definitely to lead your eye around the canvas. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, John Gummery. This kind of brings us to the end of the artist interview. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything you're working on right now? Shows you're going to be in? Lingering thoughts? Anything? Um, well, let's see. I also have some paintings at the Euphemia Gallery, which is in Spring Lake, New Jersey. I've been showing there for a few years. Um, and I have some, I have a couple la small landscapes in the works right now, which actually, as, as I work on them, uh, they're they're um, local scenes around Trenton, so they're they're small. But I'm thinking, you know, these would work on a larger size too. So I think I'm probably going to do that. I also have a, a piece that's um, up in uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts, right now. But it's it's coming home soon, unless somebody buys it, which would be wonderful. Um, but it's um, a snow scene looking out my studio window. A, a, a few years ago, I. I did a smaller version, uh, which I actually gave to my neighbor. Um, but I, I thought, no, this this is this would be something else that I could really make a larger painting of. So, um, and of course, as I as I made it, I 
I did more with it. I have falling snow and not just snow on the ground there. And in the distance, you see, you look across the river and you see the uh, New Jersey State House dome in the distance. So, yeah, that's another one that I've been excited about. So, thank you for uh, talking with me. No, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking for us and sharing all these insights into your painting. Well, it's a pleasure.